Hi, welcome back to Future Fast. And uh, like always, we have a very interesting guest. And uh, many of you in the blockchain space would be very familiar with Raj Kapoor. And uh, before I bring him into the conversation, I hope you are enjoying Future Fast. And uh, uh, quite a few of you are sharing your feedback. And uh, it's been very encouraging for us. Thank you so much. And keep doing it. And uh, for those of you, and in fact, there's a significant majority of you, you don't subscribe to Future Fast, but you do consume Future Fast. I sincerely urge you. Please subscribe to it, and we really appreciate that you follow our content. But if you subscribe, it would be a bigger motivation for us to be doing it. And uh, once again, thank you so much, and I hope you will enjoy it as much as I'm looking forward to doing it. Raj, once again, thank you so much for making time to be with Future Path. Well, you don't have to thank me. I enjoy being with you, so it's fine. It's, it's just another extension of a lovely conversation. Fantastic, Raj. Uh, uh, you you are uh, uh, very popular. Right, I mean, uh, in the blockchain space, uh, uh, I don't think there'll be a uh, any entrepreneur who is not familiar with Raj Kapoor. But uh, what we would like to hear from you now to start is your journey. Where did Raj Kapoor come from? Uh, Raj Kapoor comes from Amritsar first. Let's start with the very start, but then I'll fast forward it right up to 2010. Great childhood, uh, tough childhood, cool childhood, whatever you want to call it. Lots of ups and downs, but let's take it from 2010 when everything really started. That's where Raj Kapoor came into prominence, so to speak. In 2020, I, I basically, there was a life changing experience in my life. Uh, I lost my wife in 2010 in a very major car accident. And uh, it was the same year my daughter had sort of got a scholarship and gone to Boston University in the United States. Uh, we were to go and visit her. Uh, it, she went in August, we were to visit her in December, celebrate her birthday, celebrate Christmas, New Year, everything all in one together. However, that was not to be. A few months before that, uh, we we met in a car accident. The driver and my wife both died on the spot. Uh, it was a very, very life-changing thing for me. Life-changing in many ways. Now, I wouldn't know, I don't know how to become a father and a mother at the same time. And I went to the United States. I didn't break the news to my daughter till I went there. She was just all of 16 and just in a new country, alien country, just getting herself settled. And then this news comes. I said, I'll go and tell her myself. So I went there not to celebrate her birthday, not to celebrate New Year and Christmas, but to break the news in September, October, I think. Having said that, uh, there was a period when I was a little depressed and I was a little sad as the way things panned out for me. Blame God for everything, blame, every, blame the whole world for everything. But then well, what had to happen had to happen. And I never, I don't drink and I don't, uh, you know, go out much. So one of my friends said, what are you going to do in the house all day? You're brooding, you're getting depressed, it's not good for you. So why don't you come, I'll take you to a mine. I said, hey guy, what are you doing? pulling my leg? In which city has got a mine inside, you know? So he says, no, 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 you come here. I mean, he talked a little bit about Bitcoin and all that. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. It was way back in 2010. Uh, he took me to a mine, a little out on the outskirts, a huge warehouse, and I saw all these guys hunched over, doing all sorts of stuff on their laptops and computers or whatever. I didn't know what was that. I thought it was just a data processing center, for that matter. Uh, he told me, this is what they're doing here. They're mining out here. They're mining Bitcoin out here. So, wow, what the hell is Bitcoin mining? So he explained to me, he took me right through the whole place, explained to me, and before I knew it, I was hooked on to, long story short, it took me less than 24 hours to get hooked on to something. I said, hey, how does technology even ever manage to get somebody to earn something out of it? You're creating your own money, you're creating your own sort of a revenue or your own, own asset. What is this? Out of curiosity. So before I knew it, I started doing mining. I, was on, I started mining in 2010. Before, I didn't even know why I was doing it. Considering the fact I don't come from any, I, I don't come from a technical background at all. I was an MBA. I don't come from a technical background. So I learned, he taught me everything. The last next few days, he just kept on going and I kept on learning. It was like a new chapter opened up in my life. Something new. I found a new passion. I knew something which resonated with me. I said, yeah, let's do this. And I did that. Uh, today, I can program in 18 languages. I've built four layer one blockchains. I've done n amount of works with the Hyperledger Ethereum, including forking the Ethereum. So, so I've done a lot of work in that space. Uh, uh, so that's how I really started. And on 19th of December, 2010, I mined my first uh, bunch of coins, bitcoins, uh, celebratory stuff. 
it also happened to be my daughter's birthday so i i did <clears throat> so whenever you know before i left the usa whatever number whatever bitcoins i had actually mined by them i gifted it to her i probably the best gift that any father could have given his daughter in terms of value um she became a millionaire uh, she still remains one but uh, i gifted it to her so it's not mine any longer but that's how my journey started in this space but slowly the journey went in from understanding bitcoin to understanding the technology that powers bitcoin that is blockchain so basically i would say i went from speculation to revolution the revolutionary technology caught my fancy much more and i did a lot of work out there so in 2016 17 18 i think 16 17 or one of those i went to i went because we were in boston i went to the mit there as you know they had set up their blockchain labs out there i asked them what can we do here can i come so there was a very lovely environment we could do a lot of experimentation you know brainstorming speak with professors of the whole fledged lab out there somebody actually introduced me and got me inside there so i did a, my basic college was that but not as a formal education it was an informal education so i was 48 when i actually got into bitcoin when most people think that's time in a few years i'll retire put my legs up sit in hawaii sit somewhere or whatever and at the age of 48 i learned how to program how to code how to write code how to create software how to create applications whatever i learned at the age of 48 so i always said my you know people around me age is just a perception is up to you what you want to do it's all inside here so that's how i started off getting into the space came down to india and long story short came back in 2018 saying hey this is a great opportunity for indians indians are fantastic in technology let me bring this technology to india in the sense that nobody was talking about it in india i used to speak to a lot of people again in india same problem so shall i buy bitcoin by that time the talk was all bitcoin the all shattered shattered shadow was all bitcoin nothing else however in 2018 the first breakthrough we got was one of the one of the iit i think iit jammu it was said yes why don't you come and speak to our students and uh, the journey started really there actually because there one thing led to another some other university called etc i was called to many places i even went to the government of india submitted a paper on what blockchain can do for india as a nation which ultimately parts of it got adopted into their 2021 white paper which was taken out by uh, the government of india niti aayog fantastic that was years back parts of it not everything they took some excerpts from it and said hey this is a good thing we can do can we do this yes 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 because i had already worked on supply chain i had worked on e governance and i said these are the easy adoption for us to start in india everybody wants a little more transparency and a better system by the way this was through a company that you had started uh this i was approached not not through a company i was basically uh, the paper it, 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 i found my own company in my uh, india blockchain alliance was born in 2018 oh, so okay. i was invited on behalf of india blockchain alliance to speak at a couple of events and uh, then the rest is said became history now i've spoken i i speak at events yes but more important i work with a lot of universities 350 plus universities and colleges in india is right now where we work with and we this when i work with we have centers of excellence out there we have training we have education we have internships we have job opportunities for them right through and guide them and not just me so my entire network international and here all get together and have formed you know a sort of a, a think tank which works with all these youngsters because if you don't have education as your cornerstone you're not going to have adoption mainstream in the long run in our country and if you read nascom reports uh, we have we require 7 lakh blockchain professionals we have about 60000 right now but that's a huge gap and that can't gap cannot be filled unless it starts at the, at the you know the basic level of education that's college so that's where that's where we are we, we do a lot of work with them and uh, we work with governments in terms of helping them with their projects we work with large companies as their back end a lot of advisors for helping them tell what should be because big but the big projects go to all the big boys so sometimes we work with a lot of them and we don't get this stuff this is not our our baby but they, we work with them very closely so i'm working on about 20 25 different government projects directly indirectly mostly indirectly through all these people so we work with them we advise them we help them with the architecture the basics and so on and so forth so I, basically as iba we formed iba with the idea of trying to make blockchain mainstream in our nation and becoming a technology of choice for the nation so that we become a, you know people see us more as transparent trustworthy etc i we have succeeded to some extent the government of india is doing more than 100 projects now on blockchain not all with me but they're doing over 100 projects so i'm very glad that at least some the momentum has picked up now 
uh, two years, three years back, hardly 10, 15. Well, uh, Raj, what were you doing prior to that, uh, which made it so easy for you to uh, jump into it, learn to code? Right. And I mean, what is that uh, that you did? Yeah. I mean, you said MBA, but what was that? Yeah, I was yeah, I was doing a lot of things. Uh, you basically my job. You know, I quit working very early in life. Uh, Ninety eight, I think it was when I said hey, that's enough. Uh, why did I say it's, that's enough? Because I couldn't. Well, I had worked in the United States prior to that, multiple companies. I enjoyed that stint because it was more professional, more process oriented, and that sort of suited me. When I thought, when I decided to move to India after my daughter was born, well, like a typical father, I said, "I had you can't bring her up in the United States. India's got values, roots, blah blah blah, communities. Let's bring her up in India." Came back to India. Ironically, I came to India for my daughter. Today, my daughter is an American citizen. That is an ironic part of my life. But it's all right. She still got her Indian roots very strongly entrenched in her. And a proud Indian at that. In fact, she has a comedy show of her own called Cutting Chai. She has, yes. So she's a, she's a stand-up comedian. She's a writer. She's uh, in this space for a long, long time. Uh, anyways, so before that, uh, I really was doing a lot of work in America. Then I came to India. So I was transferred. I took a transfer from an American company to India saying, listen, I want to go back to India. My daughter is there. I'm married now. Uh, this was in the 90s I'm talking about. I was long time stint earlier than then came the stage when I realized in India, the companies were totally different from the way the foreigners work. Sorry, I couldn't adjust myself. I'm not saying they were bad. They were pathetic at those days. They're much better now. But uh, it, it, they were really like mom and pop shops. Still. I didn't like that idea. I mean, maybe it didn't. I couldn't adjust to it. I had what uh, too Americanized ingrained with the way of working there. Because it was 10, 12 years I was there. So I decided I'll, I'll start my own. Started off, uh, I met a couple of my friends uh, who are also one of my co-founders in the India Blockchain Alliance. They don't have a tech background, but they have they have something which no other founders have. It's called loyalty. So I can I, I can buy you know skills anyway, but I can't buy loyalty. And these guys were with me since '98 onwards. Aman and Harbit. These are the two guys who stood by me at that time and said, "Yeah, India, we will do something. We will do it together. Doesn't matter. We know India very well. I did not know India very well that time." And we did right from doing, you know, getting computers assembled and sold and all sorts of things. But I said, this is not for me still. I felt I had been, I was made for slightly bigger things. I did have a lot of fire in my belly, so to speak. So I decided uh, I have a lot of contacts in the US and I know the US markets very well. And these guys and me by that time knew the Indian markets very well. So we started representing a lot of American companies and a go-to-market strategy for India, the India entry market strategy. So before doing all these, I was doing India. So it could be anything. It could be tech products. It could be physical products, pharma, anything. We worked in multiple spaces. For us, it was great. We were getting a retainership in dollars, spending it in rupees, enjoying the whole show anyways. Technology came as a byproduct anyways. Some One technology company came. Then we said, this is fun because we started interacting with a lot of tech companies. And then, well, yeah, this is cool more and more and more. So we really got a little more interested in technology from an application perspective. Till that time, no programming, no coding. I don't know what these guys do. What are they doing all the time? We had no idea. Now I know. Now I've been on the other side now. But that time, yeah, it's going on. So we did well. And we did very well because we represented from the US and Australia. Then we went to Europe. So we were doing very, fairly well. So we had an Indra entry strategy company which basically specialized right from compliance setting up base here getting partners getting distributors and frankly I, we still do that now but only we focus on the blockchain and, and ai companies so we can help all these companies get you know, a seat on the table with decision makers governments etc etc so that's what i used to do before uh, and that's what we still do in a different form is just become more calibrated and more sophisticated should i say uh, we still probably do that so now as at, at, at um, India Blockchain Alliance, now we have about 800 plus partners and they are mostly global. So we work with them, helping them. What we were doing in 98, we are still more or less doing the same thing, helping them get a seat on the table with government projects, government contracts, uh, private contracts, institutions. Recently, we signed a deal with a blockchain called Velocity Network to bring in uh, transparency in the HR processes, uh, complete right from where, you know, creating career wallets for them here. So telling them the pathway, which, showing them the way. And they were very happy. They came in Jan, we signed off now recently. So it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great thing going. 
how, how do you see the uh, uh, adoption still uh, you know there's still a lot of resistance to it right yeah see whenever there's resistance that means you're doing something good that's one thing for sure i always believe that because you will all right from galileo we have seen it that everybody resists when somebody likes or, or actually speaking something good but that's a good thing so that way we know what our obstacles are how to work around them adoption is a uh, because of a lack of awareness i still say that even after so many years okay everybody knows uh, blockchain first question is it's going to be expensive second i's going to replace my system i don't know how to use it your biggest uh, ctos will come and say no, no no we don't need it you don't need it because they don't need they don't know it they're not as aware as they should be in my opinion I, i'm sure not all i'm not generalizing but some of them so i've seen a lot of resistance only because people don't have the awareness of how they can actually leverage it for their business processes but then they need to really go back and do a little introspection as to what are their processes and do they really need it or not and if they need it then try and do some small proof of concept you need to try out the new any technology should be tried out 10 years back nobody was using google pay they would be very scared of the technology we don't know what's happening everybody uses it so we are somewhere where right now google pay was 10 years back so even blockchain is somewhere there where it was about 10 years back is the question of time before people second thing is i don't, don't even say anything is blockchain the word blockchain starts putting walls in front of everybody oh crypto token cryptocurrency government will come cracking up it's a technology you got it a distributed technology you got it just a technology which you'll use with any other technology which you will go to implement you will find that resistance coming down immediately you'll just have a more secure database oh yeah security everybody says yes because everybody is scared, scared of uh, hacking etc so the, i don't use the word blockchain much although i run an indian blockchain alliance <laughs> I just tell them I'm going to make your system more robust, more secure. Bring down your expenses, operational efficiency. Bring up your ROI. Is that fine with you? Yes. What I'm going to do in the back, let 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 me do it. That's how I have actually got a lot of traction. And then I tell them why am I using blockchain? That's where it is. That I that I explain to them. If you start telling them beforehand, in my opinion, they put up a wall. Oh, blockchain, crypto. Oh, these tokens are going to be there. What are they going to? So that's not what in India they approach is that. it's the other way around outside outside you explain the benefits of blockchain and i they, they do understand it we do a lot of work in the middle east in europe etc where we don't find this resistance the resistance is in india mostly and that's also because the government doesn't have a clear policy as yet so maybe when the policy is clear the word blockchain in itself will not be such a taboo however i gave them example of the government doing multiple processes and projects on the blockchain and consequently they say oh government bhi kar raha hai acha it then becomes a different so now what we do is we do a, a proof of concept with some of the governments first so that works and then say so this is this is how it's done by the government say but government can do it why are you doing it so mm-hmm. it becomes like all right the government is doing it so they don't have any objective why well, the hell on me so it's just a strategy of how we try and make it around everybody has their own this is why this was our this is how we did it and then what we did it was a lot of awareness workshops pro bono that nobody wants to pay for is that so, the is that how did you get that that is the secret of building this uh, uh, brand raj kapoor yeah i guess so because i there was a there was an ad this which used to come many years back about maggi sweetens our sauce it's different right that right. Was, that was the tagline so i also so raj kapoor is different and i mean that i'm different because if you are drawn to what people want to hear why do you want to force yourself on to them Just let them say what they want we we'll listen and then build around that i it's worked for me i'm not complaining we are doing over 140 projects along with our partners globally so i think something is going right and everything comes through a word of mouth referral nothing none of we never advertise we never publicize so i think we are doing somebody good and you'll be also happy to know that just about the 3 months of engagement with the nigerian government we are now selling we are now doing a centralized uh, exchange for them and carbon carbon streaming exchange for them now and we are doing a project for another one of the state governments in nigeria or an agri organic agriculture uh, supply chain so this has come even in countries where we thought you know they may not necessarily be really interested in this and mind you nigeria is also more interested in crypto than in blockchain hmm. but sure. now the things are changing now there are new organizations which we partnered with which actually talk about adoption of blockchain as a technology and they don't talk about crypto and coins and tokens all the time i'm not saying this good or bad that is a different space altogether it's a space which i choose to stay out of most of the time 
I choose to stay in the space of the technology applications of real world business use cases, no, not just some fancy NFTs and fancy stuff which you talk about and raise money and then what the hell happens. So that's that. So that's that's and and then that's also helped me in a large way by a lot of corporates and companies globally approach me for advisory positions, etc. So now I think I'm on the advisory board of about 70 different companies globally. So one seven or seven zero? Seven zero. You can have a look at my LinkedIn, it's all there. So it's seven zero, I think. In India, Dubai, USA, Indonesia, Vietnam, God knows where all. A lot, all of those. How do you how do you make time for them? I mean, how much time do you spend with each of them? Well, it's like this: uh, they they can reach out to me anytime. I never have a structure. Okay, you have to call. You have to, I'll give you one hour a day or one hour a week. No, I tell them you are starting up. You are unstructured. Let's have an unstructured lifestyle. Whenever you want, reach out. We'll get. I'll get back to you within two to four hours. I always get back. There is a reason. There's there is no secret sauce here. Basically, see what do we what do they require? A guidance and direction from a product perspective. What technology to use? How to use the technology? How to raise funds? How to reach out to markets? How to reach out to decision makers? Can we get projects? Blah blah blah. Same. It's not different. Every startup has similar challenges, of course, in different shapes and sizes, but they are all similar. So therefore, it's easier for me to calibrate fast because and, and also what happens because I know so many of them. I know okay, this one's making something similar. Why don't I just plug it inside here? Or I can plug this inside and make this a more robust ecosystem and a robust product vis-a-vis -vis something which would be a standalone product for them. So I bring in the ecosystem around it. I'm building the partnerships around it. Therefore, the valuation goes up and therefore the valuation is, seems more visible to VCs and seed, seed capitalists and all. It's a win-win it's a situation for everybody. An ecosystem is what you need to build. You, you build your product, but better than that, you build an ecosystem around that as well. That has been my secret sauce. It's not so secret. It's a sauce. That's all I'll say. It's like they say when you make chai, when you have chai, tea, you have water, you have you have tea leaves, you have sugar, you have milk, you have ginger or cardamom, whatever. The mix of it makes it a fantastic beverage. Otherwise, individually everything is pretty boring and banal. So that's what I do. I make nice masala chai or a lovely coffee or a lovely filter coffee, which is from Bangalore. Which, is, which I always love. And that's what we do. And we bake it with precision. So you have the right quantity going at the right time. So when I advise 70 companies, I'm helping each one of them calibrate with the other rather than compete with the other. That helps a lot. And I also do a lot of work in trying to get, okay, now they, I also learn from them. Okay, this is what they're doing. Can we plug it in here? Can I give it better than? So basically improve the product. Product improves, valuations improve. And I tell them always, first, chase the customer, don't chase the VC. So for VCs, I always say, if you don't want to show your CV, you become a VC. That's why I've always told people in my life. <laughs> so I said, those are the guys you don't go to because 90% VC, 80-90% VCs are not really VCs. There are layers between them. So let's chase the customer. If a customer validates, everybody else starts falling in line. Not always the right thing, but yes. Uh, that's what I have always felt. And that's what I think has worked for us. And uh, it's only referrals that give me all these. Uh, otherwise, 70 people, 18, 60, 70 people are not foolish to have me on their board because they pay me as well. Well, you have 70 companies that you advise. And uh, you also uh, advise uh, quite a few governments, right? In, uh... Yes. Yes. So government is even easier. Okay. Uh, but you have to just uh, basically take yourself back to 2010 or 2015 and start talking to them like you're talking to the new bunch of students. It's easy, but they're receptive and that is good. And we have workshops with them. And makes, you know, and of course, I always work on a proof of concept. Make the proof of concept. Show them what it is. 90% of the people in our country, especially, are hesitant to make a proof of concept because they have to put money from their pockets. Because the government says, listen, I don't know, you show me what you have to show me, but I'm not putting any, unless it's a very, uh, unless it's a mandated expense. No, but even after POC, uh, where do you get money from government? Well, most of the time you don't get it. Yeah, but that's the problem, get, right? You get, people, you get people who fund the project because you get a government stamp here. You can get it from other governments and you can get it from a private enterprise. You use the same architecture. You don't know, you're not giving out the IP. To so the, the doing a POC to the government agency is more of a marketing effort. To uh, demonstrate for me, your for me, marketing, 
I, I, for me, it is marketing, also proving and validating a point. Hmm. Marketing is one point, but validation of what you're trying to do is very important. And if the government approves and adopts it, it's in India, it becomes, ah, oh, now the government has adopted it, now we will do it. If the government doesn't adopt it, why the hell are we doing it? A lot hmm. of people. Hmm. So I, I, that's my way of thinking it, thinking that if the government, it, it does work a lot if you get a government approval. It, oh, approved by government of India. Oh, government of India. It's a very, very big thing for a lot of people. It becomes a fantastic collateral also, as you said correctly, marketing is a very, very big thing because then even when you take it abroad, they don't know you've done free or I mean, Basically, it's I mean, sometimes it may be paid, sometimes not, whatever. But even then, they feel the validation is complete and then they talk to you in a different tone. There's right. a different... Yeah, but it's like you know you gotta invest in, in invest in it yourself first sometimes before you see the results. It's like growing a tree, apple tree. You gotta you know plant it yourself before the apples come out. The fruit comes later. Why don't we think like that? We think that the fruit should come right as soon as we plant the seeds. That's the biggest mistake most entrepreneurs in India make. Well, uh, Raj, uh, part of your brand Raj Kapoor is also that uh, denim uh, printed shirt with the tie and sleeves folded. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. How did you arrive at this? Okay, I arrived at it in, I got married again in 2015. Okay. Uh, after five years, from 2010 to 2015, I kept on doing, I kept on learning what I did and I became what I came, became from a professional perspective. Uh, there was a huge change in my personal life after 2015 because my wife, she loves colors. She loves colors. I remember I had a, a third, I had a shirt from the Ziba, I think, I think Zara, Zara. Zara shirts. I had lots of Zara shirts and I used to wear them regularly at various... I, I was a regular playing guy. Gray, blues, whites, standard standard ties. And uh, my wife said, yeah, you're, you are such a colorful person. Why do you wear such state colors? She said, I don't know. I, didn't, I don't know whether India is ready for it. She says, whether India is ready for it or not, I don't know. You be ready for it. I'm going to change your entire wardrobe. You know what she did? She gave all my Zara clothes, uh, clothes to the buy. She gave it to the buy. She gave it to my maid servant and told you to take it for your son. I said, what the hell? Yeah, it's very expensive clothes. So in 2015, my wardrobe changed almost overnight. And then I realized that all right, I I don't I don't look so bad in colored shirts and you know printed unique ties. Yes, you're right. Those are my <laughs> stamps. And I have never worn a plain shirt after that. Or if I want a plain shirt, the tie has been colorful. Or if it's a shirt, otherwise, it's, you can see me. It's not a conventional shirt anyway. I'm married. So she changed my way of... And not only did she change my wardrobe, she changed my entire perspective towards life. And I became more of a person for the world. And I lived what I really was. It was the first time I lived as Raj Kapoor, which I am. Because I speak a lot. I meet a lot of people. I am. I crack jokes and every now and then. And I enjoy people. I enjoy things. And I find humor in almost everything. And color. And these became the colors of my life. These became the colors of my way of working. So I would use them. And I use the same thing in my presentations. I use the same thing. You'll uh, rarely see me very boringly dressed, I would say. When I say boringly dressed, then I have some very government function that I'm a little boringly dressed. Otherwise, I am, I am what I am. Well, uh, what was the 20-year-old Raj Kapoor aspiring to be? And where do you see today oh, yeah. in that scale? <laughs> the 20-year-old, I'll go back a little bit. I'll go back a few more years because that's where it all started. I'll go back to a 12-year-old Raj Kapoor in school. Suddenly decided that he's now he's in this from 7th to 8th standard. And suddenly now there have become more science books and more mathematics books than they were before in the 7th standard. So when I went to the 8th, I really felt that this is not, school is not meant for me. I didn't want to be in school. Forget class. I didn't want to be in the school only. And uh, I did, I said, but my parents obviously would not think of it at all. I had, by that time, I had lost my father at the age of 12, 12 and a half. So I just lost my father. Uh, and he also died in a uh, two-wheeler accident. He had a two-wheeler. And uh, I was uh, the only one. I was the man of the house, so to speak. And uh, I was the elder brother. So I was... And my mom said, hey, no way, you better study. you got to get... you got to be the man of the house and study. And all the good stuff she told me. God bless her soul. Uh, she died about 30 odd years back also. But uh, she put me at least... You'll be in school. Otherwise, I was all set to leave school. Oh, very happy. Leave. I'm not going from the next day. So... I decided, okay, if I'm in school, now how do I miss class? And those days, bunking was not an option because we were in a Christian school. We were in St. Columbus High School. 
proper strict Christian school, Irish brothers, foreign teachers, you know, the foreign Irish, uh, you know, missionaries teaching us. I decided, oh, I, why don't I play football or hockey? I was come from Punjab, so I used to play hockey a lot. So I started playing hockey. Hockey, we go over practice and all. But every time we play hockey match, we'd come back in 70 minutes, 80 minutes. That football, come back in 90 minutes. I chose cricket. Those days, we used to have 25 over a side match. Cricket kept me out of class all day. Look at my strategy. My, my strategic thinking started in school at the age of 12, 13. And then I said, oh, this is good. If I play cricket, there are two big advantages. One, I stay out of class. And second, all the girls come and watch cricket. They don't watch football and hockey. That was good. That's how Raj Kapoor would get girlfriends now. Yeah, I didn't have many girl girlfriends before that. And uh, soon, I became a very good cricketer. Became a school, my junior school team captain. I had n number of girlfriends around me. I didn't even know. My vice captain used to put her names in the diary. So my, his job was that besides being a vice captain, if he wanted to remain a vice captain, he would have to remain right on all my dates, which date I'm meeting whom on which date. He was my uh, diarist and uh, vice captain. <laughs> then um, after that, I started playing at a very early age. I started playing junior national level, uh, state level cricket. So that kept me in good stead. So the Raj Kapoor became a team player. Raj Kapoor became... Yeah, a guy who got strategize and never and still not fail in his class by doing the right things, ticking the right boxes. Nobody would fail a school team captain. I started playing for Punjab and I, I have even played uh, Raji Trophy for Punjab State. So wow. I reached Raji's uh, Deodhar Santosh Trophy. So the Raj Kapoor became Raj Kapoor actually from there. At 20, he was a very much well, well settled uh, Raj Kapoor knowing what he wants to do. One thing uh, that by 20, I wanted to do only one thing, get a job. I had no idea what, because by that time, sports was not the only thing. There was no bread and butter in cricket in those days. So in uh, 82, 83, approximately, I, I brought 83, I quit uh, playing professional cricket because uh, job was became necessary. And uh, also, if, if you remember, uh, there were riots, there were anti-Sikh riots around that time. So I am by birth a Sikh. I am by birth a Sikh. Oh, 83, 84. Yeah, yeah. 84, oh, 83 yeah. was the World Cup. Bindran Wale Haan, Those were the days. Those were the days. So I was, and you were in Amritsar. I was not in. I was by that time. I had migrated to Delhi. Oh, so, okay. but I was in Amritsar only for two years. I was born there. That's about all. My father came to bomb, uh, Delhi and then Delhi. I was in Delhi all this while. So during that time was a time when a uh, very young Rajkumar had. Uh, no hair. I mean, we had to uh, do that. And by that time, I wanted two things only. One, I should either join the army because I had by that time seen two wars, one with uh, China and uh, one with Pakistan. And I said, this is the, my, my life is for the army, for my nation. Not knowing what the hell happens on the battlefield, but knowing very well that I should hold a gun in my hand and get an opportunity to lob some bombs across at that time. Not knowing why they are the enemy for that matter also. So uh, that was my, the Raj Kapoor at 20 wanted to become uh, clearly a soldier. Not, no, but want... uh, that was also the time a lot of uh, Punjabis immigrated to Canada, US, yes, because yes, there was also yes. a big hatred for India among Punjabis. I mean, right? I mean, yes. it's, it's a mixed thing, right? Yes, I mean, yes, it's... No, 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 completely. Uh, you were right. I had the same hatred because we had seen And a lot still of... wanted to be in Indian Army? I mean, that's quite a contradiction, right? Indian, for Indian a... Army. For me, Indian Army was different from India. In How my is mind. that? I mean, I'll tell you. I hated politicians from that day. I hated How old were I, you? 20? I think 84, when it happened, I was about 21, 22. I was 21, 22. Boy, I I was mean, must have been uh, that. Uh, I mean, it was a horrible it time, was, right? In, it was a horrible time because we saw our cousins getting killed in front of our rights and politicians leading those, those attacks. I won't name whom. I don't want to name them. They are all no, they, are, they are published in n number of books today. Yeah, and yeah, they are so still, that, unfortunately, some of them are still yeah, so sitting MP or ministers. Exactly. Them. And from that day, from that day till today, I hate politics and politicians. That, that remains. I work with governments, but I don't work for the government. I work for my nation because they are the government. That's governance. And if I can do something from a good governance perspective, it works. If it doesn't, I don't. If it doesn't, I don't have any political ambitions. That's for sure. So that's the time when I said that politicians. I will always hate, and I still have. I don't say hate now. I, I'm totally indifferent to politics now. At that time, but I loved the army. 
army why because uh, i felt patriotism is a much bigger a much better emotion than hatred no but around that time there were uh, small mutinies yes. within the army of punjabis wanting to lead the army yes. yeah yes i had my un- i had an uncle in the who was in the air force not in the army his name was uh, he was a air vice marshal he had become an air vice marshal at that time keith lewis was his name air vice marshal keith lewis he actually came and sat me down and said listen you channelize your hatred join the army you because air force i had no idea because you need science and all <laughs> no chance no chance uh, what all these panels he took me to a plane i said oh, i can't fly this damn thing i can crash it for sure so he says you join the army i didn't want to join the navy because i don't like water uh, I, days and days on water i can't stand it i my mind and body is too active i can't remain in one place so is the army is the right thing for you you can burn off all the extra energy hatred whatever you have there and you'll be also have a disciplined life life which at that time i did not have so he wanted to inculcate this and he was he, had, he used to come and be like the father we never had because uh, his son and all we were our friends and uh, my father he was my father's friend and we have family we were family friends and he was the one who talked to me either to get into the army or to get into a job and start focusing because he says listen wherever you go you need to earn money and put bread on the table for your damn family so that's what he told me and he was a boxer so he gave me a punch and said listen you do one of these two things otherwise i'll punch you next time on your face so that was a punch on my chest i took it on my chest not on my chin and i said okay but by, by that time i think i just my my mother told me to listen you're the eldest one if you go in the army and something happens to you a little bit of emotional uh, talk so i didn't join the army but i did uh, start thinking of work and then i got i got work very fast and very easily in fact uh, i was always working up prior to that also i was working from a very early age when i lost my dad in fact my first job was delivering toys and gifts and games and books to people's houses that was my first i was a delivery boy uh, and i had a cycle which i was very thrilled because i could never afford a cycle till that time so i was very thrilled i got my own bike i have got my own and i should get tips and i should make my money more than my pocket money which was 2 rupees at that time so i was good the life was good and uh, at 20 i had no i, have, I was pretty directionless i became, i got some sort of direction I, after i finished my mba because i was in a sports quota i got a good job i got into tatas uh, i got into tatas very early i got into tata sons which also became a very interesting story and it is part of my folklore that also makes me raj raj kapoor is uh, everybody was we, all our friends were celebrating that we got great jobs i got many jobs in the tata company different tata company that time they used to get many job offers uh i chose tata sons sir told me sabse best hai. i had no idea what tata sons was i read to be very honest i was from delhi that was more of a bombay company but i was uh, i done my mba in bombay by the way so i came to tata sons i went to the office and i said yuck what a boring office anyway i sat down and uh, somebody gave me a typewriter in front of my hand put a typewriter in front my lady put a typewriter in front of my desk i said ma'am what is this typewriter she says you have to learn from the start begin i said i am an mba i am a management trainee uh what wh- wh- what is this So you have to learn from starting. Tata, we all learn from the beginning. Okay, fine. I, by the afternoon, I had typed my resignation letter. The afternoon, I put it under the typewriter, and I was out of Tata Sons' half day job, half day job. And I wrote also, I please, I do not need my salary for the day. Also, I wrote that in the letter also. Being very, 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 I don't know. Everybody sitting here, you Tata got no credit. Shorty, you left Tata's job. I said, yeah, I left the job. All right. Why did I leave the job? I tell you, but by the night I decided what I do next. I, next day I took up a job with Taj Taj Group Hotel, Tata, uh, you know, the, India Hotel. Yeah, Tata India Hotel. Group. Yeah, Taj. So I said, that's. They said, what is this Taj Group? Because th- that time getting into a hotel was considered really demeaning or not such a great thing as compared to a Tata Sons corporate blah blah. So I listed my reasons. We were having a, there was a, in Bombay there is a restaurant called Majestic. There's a majestic now no longer there I guess but I we were sitting in majestic having fried rice and coke Coca Cola and or some fizzy drink anyways and uh, I said listen guys they were the rest of them had taken the jobs in Tata Sons another Tata company I said when you go to Tata Sons look at the ambience it was very boring look at me now I'm inside the five star lobby look at where you are look at where I am you are sitting under a fan I'm sitting on the AC. you are wearing a blue shirt and chappals and sandals and i am wearing a five star suit paid for by the company i don't have look at my logic that was my logic 
my logic was right in in its own way but came up that became evident later on and i said listen you are sitting with all the uncles and aunties all grey haired people all around you i am sitting with the best people who can only afford five star stuff they are all around me you guys are never going to network i will network and my networking started from there by the way that's because and the networking was not for a job so much yes i wanted a job maybe i wanted a job in the us at time i wanted to go to the us very badly every Indian, every kid or us canada wherever anybody can get me out of this country and also i wanted to marry a green card holder so that i could get a green card in the us that was my career strategy originally i don't advise anybody to follow it but that was mine in those days and talking about 90s 80s 90s don't do it guys today but i those days i could afford or i did i took my first leap of faith there by kicking out a tata sons boring job and taking another one which was more which was more me which basically were the colors of me which i wear today so that became my sort of trademark this guy is a rebel sort of a guy he'll always do something go off the off trodden path he'll always do something my mother was saying shall because kuch bhi and when i used to bring home a lot of goodies from the uh, hotel she was very happy we had never seen all those things before in our lives and we enjoyed a good life decent life but i never met a green card Uh, <laughs> that was my next question <laughs> uh, that didn't happen but i did meet one gentleman who actually sponsored my job to the us in 11 months from the time i joined i was in the us working how, how did that happen uh, there used to be these lot of american guys coming i was working in the taj group so all the best of people used to live in taj there were only taj and ogroys mostly at that time now there are plenty of them that time they used to either say taj or they used to say ogroys so we used to have these guests that i was in charge because i was a good uh, you know i was good at interpersonal relationships and speaking etc so i was always given the task of you know asking them for all the vip guests etc we got along very well he was here on a three months project uh, you know with so he said yeah, raj uh, you want to go to uh, you want to go to the uh, us help boy take the words are right out of my mouth uh, and he said yes uh, i said yeah what, what do i have to do you tell me he says wait i'll see what i can do you will have to compromise on your work i i have a i have a friend who's got a huge supermarket chain in the us to keep looking for good people i'll try and get you there hi sir i'll do it what's the salary he says 1000 dollars oh 1000 very good 1000 dollars we never seen i was earning about 6 700 bucks uh, i was at the moon that time it was 18 20 bucks a dollar whatever i was oh the moon i counted the days the day he left for the airport i started saying a prayer for him every day Like, come on and get back to me get back to me he did and he took me to the us 11 months at 12 or 12 months from the time i joined i was in the united states no problem i was working in a supermarket but i was in the united states i lived my first dream so my leap of faith of choosing the next the thing of my first leap of faith was choosing cricket the second leap of faith was taking an unconventional taj group of hotels at that time as a stepping stone to get into another space and my father my all my friends said yes you were right you network here we are still here and we still haven't got any promotions that they you have gone to the united states so i became a, a, a sort of a folklore for them yeah raj yeah raj me to say humne kyun nahi kiya like that so lot of them started saying that and uh, well it worked out well i mean i'm not saying it it may have worked out the other way around also but uh, i guess uh, when you take your chances uh, you you have as much chance of success as much of failure so it just depends on the tipping point and at what time it happens so my tipping point worked well for me and that gave me a lot of industry a, a international exposure as well so that was raj in the 20s so uh, you you happy with where you are today from if that raj would be happy with where you are today he is very happy Yeah. Did, oh, I, the Raj would have wanted to stay in US. Just give me a moment. I just can sure, I say sure. it? Yeah, one second. Just put a. Yeah. So that Raj uh, did what he wanted. This Raj does exactly what he wants. There's hardly been any deviations, uh, any deviation from there. The, we have, I've not deviated. I've been very fortunate that in my both my marriages, my first marriage and my next marriage, both my wives have been extremely supportive in the Raj. Which they both had at the, at some point of their time, uh, one of them is still opposed with me. What what would this Raj advise to that Raj now, looking back? Do exactly what he did. I won't yeah. do anything. <laughs> Change <laughs> nothing. Not to the rest of the public, but to that Raj, I would tell the same thing. You want to kill somebody? 
tell them what to do and they will get killed you tell them go ahead and live your dream even if you fall you you had your nightmare it's not anybody else this is your nightmare if you succeed it's your dream so i lived my dream i didn't have the nightmare and then i unlike many people who say we had this struggle that struggle i never had that struggle i never had that the struggle was in the beginning but when i chose my path and decided to take my leaps of faith from time to time they worked for me see everybody's life and circumstances are different this raj will tell raj do the same thing you cannot do anything else and that raj will tell this raj also the same thing you are doing exactly what you did that time the whole combinations have changed and the permutation everything is changed but everything basically the way you talk the way you think it is the same so that time also i was ideating way beyond what was the norm today also i am ideating way beyond what's the norm and maybe that's one of the reasons of success even in my work where i am now great raj can you recommend some of your favorite books or podcasts or even films movies that you think uh, people should read listen to or watch yeah well i i i read a book very years back it was uh, i read rich dad poor dad i loved that i read also i i see what happens when i started reading many books i started getting more and more confused everybody had their own piece of advice so i stopped reading all the books to be very honest so if you ask me which is your favorite book i would say actually speaking it is the gita if you ask me it is the master book for all strategies ever implemented in do you read it still i read it now i have in fact i have got an ai generated gita somebody gifted it to me a few days back his name is deepak he is um, you know he used so, so he gave it to me and he said that you sir you help me i, I wrote the forward for it also and uh, he and when he gave it to me it gave me even today i learn new uh, sort of lessons from it which i never learned some time back and i have had i was been reading the gita at every stage of my life and the mahabharat mahabharat is completely full of strategy political strategic war you you are a sardar right uh, yes, yes is that a part of your culture to read gita and mahabharat for me the culture is read what you like i have read i have read the granth sahib the granth sahib doesn't teach you strategy it teaches you the way of path of life which is what i follow i follow the path of life laid by the granth sahib which is my book basically but uh, do you also have gita at home i mean i didn't know that yeah yeah we i have everything i even have a copy of the quran inside no i mean uh, i mean since your childhood your uh, since my your childhood friend? i was a, somebody gave me the gita as a gift uh, by rajagopal acharya or something the book by rajagopal acharya and it was a simple version of gita i don't understand yes, first yes. Uh, he he wrote the philosophy version. in two volumes yeah, yeah. i said you know samajh nahi aa raha so so he says you know i'll give you a simple version you read it and i was actually caught on so more than any all the big boys who write all the leadership books i really have not read too many of them i'll be very honest i can give you names rattle them off and say but i honestly have read most of them i read a little bit but i i like barack before obama there was a book i read barack before obama that taught me a lot also i think that would be a good book then which one was there there was another one very nice one and uh, mm, friends love on the big terrible things i read that that gave me a lot of life lessons i i also liked swami vivekananda if you write if you read swami vivekananda he teaches you the right ways path of life i i don't advocate him i just like what he wrote and i love if you really have read the if you read the uh this thing uh, the but even the guru granth sahib it gives you the best most simple way of living a life without complicating it without getting into too many things simple be good do good <laughs> do you don't have right everything basically yeah, all books tell us the same thing but it it made it very simple for me because it was written in a in the 15th century so because it was written little later on in life maybe it learned from other mistakes of all the others and so let's make a simple version of it you don't want complications so it still remains simple and i still remain i still go to the gurudwara to do seva or they say is that everybody rich poor everybody should do seva in fact from my childhood we were taught that you know even i i would see millionaires carry the shoes dust them carry on their head and place them in the racks i felt humbled i said if everybody can be humble and humility which is two two things which nobody can teach you they have to be with you or you, you have to inculcate it and they got inculcated so early part of my life is very much there and it remains a cell till today we on the road. we have no problem meeting anybody even on the road side or anything so coming back these books are the ones which helped me 
I honestly don't listen to podcasts. I honestly don't listen to that. And I can give you names. I know all the famous names. I've got a whole bunch of them. People keep sending me here. Yeah. But honestly, I read the Gita and the Mahabharata, which taught me the way of life and the strategies of life. And I read, I read, I read uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu many years back. I still think that is one of the better books I read that had actually taught me a lot of things. And right before that, I used to do a lot of, uh, read a lot of Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was my, that was the foundation from where I feel that I have come. Maybe traditional, yes, very traditional, very old. But then I'm old, I'm in my 60s, I'm 62. And uh, so I, I'm enjoying that space. So I, in my case, it was only those. And by the time I became really, now I don't have the time to read books, to be very honest. I do listen to podcasts, but that's a random. If I like the subject or the topic, I'll, re, I'll go through it. If I don't like it, after five minutes, it's off my system. But yeah, I still read the Gita and I still try and take out meanings from it everywhere. In fact, I've actually written a whole series of uh, strategies which we cleaned from the Gita. Taking that, that's my book, which I hope to publish one day. Oh, interesting. Wonderful. So we should, we should uh, probably, uh, maybe because you don't read, you should make it an audio book. <laughs> I'll make it an audio book for sure, because I'll only not read it otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Raj. Uh, this is uh, seriously as colorful as your dress. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure everybody who have seen you in so many places can vouch for it. Uh, I mean, in every picture, the most colorful, colorful, uh, <laughs> in a small picture, colorful dot. If go zoom in, that would be you because you, you're That's always uh, yeah, so I, wonderful. Yeah, I like to wear my colors on my sleeve. I don't want to hide them. So why hide them? So only one life why? you can. Absolutely, them. absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your journey and uh, to the audience and uh, listeners. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Do come back soon because we're going to uh, uh, dive into uh, Raj Kapoor's world, of what he's doing and uh, how uh, he's helping in shaping the world with uh, blockchain and few other things that he's busy with. And uh, till we meet again, enjoy the ride and also please share it with those you think will appreciate it. Once again, Raj, thank you so much. Thank you again. Thanks again.